Well, let me start by thanking Ron Vale and the iBiology team for this opportunity to talk to you today about a very important subject, which is the NIH support for biomedical funding. And I want to begin by giving you a little bit of background about myself and why I think this is a topic I should be commenting on. So I've received my MD and PhD degrees from Harvard University and moved directly on to the faculty where my research was supported by grants that went to my mentor and department chair, Baruch Benasserif. So for a number of years, I could concentrate solely on my science and not on raising funds to do that science. But of course, eventually, I needed to submit an R01 application. I did that, received a funding award, but then took a year off to study molecular biology, having been only a cellular immunologist to that point in time. And while I was doing this year off at NIH, I was offered a tenured position in the Laboratory of Immunology. I took that offer, and I've been at NIH in the intramural program ever since. For those of you who don't know, that intramural program is funded in a way that's quite different than the R01 system. We are retrospectively reviewed every four years by an external panel. And if we've done well in the previous period, our funding is renewed, and that's been the case for me for now more than 30 years. And so I've been able to focus almost exclusively on my science and not on raising the funds for that science. And it's enabled me to move from a cellular immunologist to a molecular immunologist and from a molecular immunologist to a cell biologist studying protein transport and cellular signaling, and for the last 15 years to concentrate on advanced imaging. And in all those areas, I'm doing things that I neither was originally trained to do nor had known expertise in. And those of you listening can understand that it would be virtually impossible in the standard R01 grant system to get funding for that type of switch in careers without already having shown that I could do the work. And yet that's been the course of my career. And I contrast that with my experience and my colleagues in the extramural world, especially since the sequestration and the reduction in NIH funding more and more of their time is spent writing grants. It's now estimated to be, by many of them, more than 50% of their time, taking them away from the lab and their concentration on their science. And the awards have become almost stochastic at a certain level in terms of the relationship between the quality of the science people are doing and their ability to maintain continuous support. The system has become stultified in the sense that there's now a very formal rubric for how grants are written. For example, you must have a hypothesis and then aims, and then within the aims, you must have preliminary data for about 50% of what you claim you will accomplish in the future. And then in addition to that, you also have to say how you will fix anything that doesn't actually work out several years in advance. And those of us who do science know that that's not actually how science really works. It's not that predictable or that linear when you're doing things at the cutting edge of a field. So how does that really translate into thinking about going forward? And so for many years, I've been in discussions with people about what it is that really relates uh, an individual to the likelihood of success in science. And for most people, not everybody, there's a combination of innate intelligence and focus, dedication, hard work, whatever you wish to call it, that in combination was able to drive those people through in their early schooling years to predictable entry into a good college or university, and from that into a medical school or graduate program, and from that into a fellowship or postdoctoral position, and then even onto a job. And although there's an increase in competition at each of those levels and somewhat of a pyramid, the ego structure of the people have been uh, formed in a way in which they felt they could make it to the next level on their own merits. But then they get a job, they have to go into the R01 system, and life becomes rather unpredictable when you're already in your late 30s. The career you've trained for may not be the career you have if because of, as I say, the stochastic nature of funding at the 8 or 10 percent level and the, dis the dichotomy between writing grants as opposed to doing science comes to the fore. 
And so how can we square that circle? How do we deal with that? Well, the answer is the NIH intramural program, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and other granting agencies in many areas have come up with an answer, and that is to support the person and not the project. And I've asked people around the country at all different levels in their research career, if I gave you $20 million that you had to distribute for research, and you could only have either a CV or a specific project proposal, which would you take? 100% of the answers are the CV. And yet, we continue to say the best system is to support the projects through the R01 system. There's something wrong with that picture. And so the proposal that I would like to make is that we move to this person, not project, approach consistently in our funding and replace the R01 system. Now, how would that work, and why is this especially good for early career investigators? So as I said, everything seems to work OK until you get your first job. And then although you get startup funding, you're under pressure fairly early to get an R01 grant. And you spend increasing time away from the bench writing and writing and writing. In this new scheme, if you get the job, you get the money. You get enough support for a lab of four or five people for five to seven years, during which time you get to show your stuff. You can then move away from the next incremental work that comes out of your postdoctoral training period, do something really new, really creative that you would like to do. And then at the end of that time period, you're reviewed retrospectively, as is done in the intramural program or for Howard Hughes. And there are several possible outcomes. The first is you got very little done, with some exceptions for time off for family reasons or health or in certain circumstances where a year or two of bridging funding might be critical for completing risky uh, or late starting projects, basically those individuals will not succeed in the system. And I think most people would agree that after six to eight years of funding at this level, if you cannot produce a reasonable body of work, maybe that's not the best investment of federal dollars. A larger group of people, however, will have done very credible work during that period but not necessarily groundbreaking or field-leading work. They'll get renewed, but at the same level of support plus inflation as they originally had. The labs will not grow substantially. And I'll come back to why that uh, is the case a little later. And the third group are the stars, people who really made major advances. They can ask for additional funding, but they need to be careful. This is not a ratchet system, and that the next cycle of review if they've not done quite as well, their funding might decrease again. And we can discuss or debate as to whether such fluctuations are good or bad in the system, but I think in the end, uh, they're the appropriate way to have a merit-based system that relates your activities and productivity to your funding base. So what are some of the concerns and what are some of the specific implementation issues that uh, arise in thinking about this plan. So the first question is, where does the money come for supporting these new hires at this level? And I think the obvious answer is to take what is already in K99s and K22s and those R01s that junior faculty do get and other like uh, federal support, aggregate it, and then redistribute it. That will limit the number of people can, who can be employed as new faculty this way but I'll come back in the end to why that's absolutely critical. The second thing is, are these awards made to individuals who bring them with them when they get a job, or is it through institutions that have block grants that then distribute this to their new hires? And I favor the latter for a very uh, simple set of reasons. First of all, if you estimate that there are maybe a few hundred new biomedical research openings a year around the country, and on average, there tend to be two to 300 applicants for each of those, even factoring in people applying for, to five or 10 institutions, that's several thousand new proposals that would have to be reviewed and vetted and awarded by NIH each year. And even if that was done well, the individuals getting the money would not be matched to the openings in the universities, whereas an institution can award this funding 
directly to those they wish to hire. Now, other people have said, gee, maybe the institution will uh, use that money in inappropriate ways. And I think that's not necessarily the case. And the reason is the renewal of that money for continued hires will be based on how well the people they hired in the previous round do when they go into the retrospective review system. If that money doesn't go directly to those individuals, and if they're not fully supported by the institution, there's likely to be poor success at that level and the loss of the funding. And even top institutions, once this system is in place, will be in difficulty in hiring the very best people if they cannot make these offers or they're not willing to spend enormous amounts of their own resources to give equivalent funding to those they hire. There are other benefits from this approach. In terms of the review, the panels can be broader than they are now. There are fewer things to grants to review or applications to review if you've rolled everything into a single or maybe two um, applications that go to one or two institutes depending on the nature of your work. That lightens the load, enables more people to participate in the review process, and it makes it um, less parochial and less focused on the details of the project and more on the accomplishments of the individuals. So let me end by saying, gee, isn't there a simpler answer to all of this, which is more money in the NIH budget? And the answer is uh, you need to do a back of the envelope calculation. If there are somewhere between four to 10 people in the average size lab, we'll discount the 20 and 30 person labs you see on the concluding slides in almost every conference, and people are in the lab for four to six years, that means the reproduction rate is somewhere between one and two of every PI every year. The statistics are that a quarter of the people who come out of such training programs become PIs. So that means NIH would need to double its budget approximately every four years. That's simply an untenable increase going forward and doesn't even include inflation. And so the real answer has to be population control. And as I said at the beginning, part of what will happen in going to this type of approach is to bring fewer people into the system, but to support them better. There will need to be other adjustments to graduate programs and to people choosing to become research associates or staff scientists rather than PIs. But many people actually would prefer that. And I think if we change our sociology to really uh, respecting and actually appreciating people who do that type of work in the laboratory on a long-term basis, that will actually improve our output. And also, by having these smaller groups, it will be harder to do multidisciplinary work within each group, and that will foster longer-term interactions and collaborations among um, very highly competent groups in different areas to really drive the research process forward. So I think overall, this is a plan that really deserves good discussion among the groups. I've talked to hundreds of students, postdocs, junior and senior faculty. The response to this proposal has been overwhelmingly positive. Virtually no one has defended the current R01 grant system or the project rather than person approach we've been taking. And I think that there are issues having to do with the non-monolithic nature of NIH in terms of implementing what I've suggested, but I think there are solutions to that. And there are issues people have raised about whether the rich will get richer, how do you portion the money among institutions, but I think those are all things that can be well done. And so in the end, I hope that this has been an interesting discussion for you and that you'll consider this and in the many blogs and Twitterdom uh, arenas in which these are areas are discussed uh, endlessly, that there'll be some uh, groundswell of interest in considering a real change to the way NIH does its research support. Thanks very much.